Mondo Salavanti. Mondo Salavanti. Who is Mondo Salavanti? This guy is the man. And Mondo over here is very wise in the art of finance. There's not many guys that I come across on LinkedIn that are absolutely crushing it just in life and the way that they think and the way that they act and what they're doing. I started playing football when I was 10 years old. I was 20 pounds over the weight limit though. So my dad basically said to me as a 10 year old kid, he's like, look, if you want to play, we got to diet, we got to run, we got to train, we got to start working out. So I'm 10 years old and like I'm going on this straight up fitness regimen. Like I remember my dad taking me on runs and like quick side lesson in the story is just leadership. Like my dad just ingrained that in me of like, ask people to do things that you will do as well. I just remember looking back to the year past. I, rem I remember sitting in Italy at a dinner and vividly thinking this, like I just went after a goal that was given to me by other people, not a goal that I really wanted for myself. When you go to change your habits, things are gonna be difficult. So when things get difficult, if you don't have any bigger purpose that you're linking the sacrifices you're making in the present to, you're going to quit when times are hard. There's no need to complicate things. Let's stay, let's stick to the basics. Hi, my name is Laura Mai. Welcome to the Answers Podcast. Today, I interviewed Mondo Salavanti, who is a certified financial planner and also kind of a social media genius. Mondo has a lot of high net worth clients and he gives a lot of really good advice throughout this interview. So I really hope you enjoy and get as much value out of it as I did. Okay, let's get into it. I guess I just wanted to start in on, can you introduce yourself and tell us how you started growing your own business and your brands? First off, Laura, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. And my story is a little bit unique on how I got started on social media. So a lot of people don't know this about me, but when I was in college, I graduated like right in the middle of the pandemic at the end of 2020. So before that, the in the spring, in the summer, I started reselling sneakers like Nikes, Jordans, Yeezys, like all these uh, more expensive sneaker brands. And I built that on Instagram primarily. I, I built an account almost to 10,000 followers, was doing over a hundred pairs a month at my peak. And wow. it was like, a, it was like a real business where I'm in college. I was just doing it for fun because I was bored with the pandemic, shipping shoes all over the world. The next thing I know, I'm like, I have a real business here. This is a little crazy. Wow. Now, now why that plays into all of this, I plan to go into finance from the beginning. This was, well, not necessarily from the beginning, but at that point in my life, I knew that financial advice was the industry I wanted to get into. And when I graduated, I was gonna start. So I'm reselling sneakers. I was also interning with the company that I run my practice through now. And I graduate and I start this business. Now the sneaker business was built completely through Instagram. So I'm like, okay, I need to grow my financial advice business from zero how do I do this through social media like I did with sneakers? That led me to LinkedIn. And the reason, quite frankly, was like, I don't know how many people are going to think, oh, I need a financial advisor. Let me go to Instagram, which right. maybe some people, maybe some people do. But I just thought LinkedIn might have been a better place to start. So back in 2022, which was two years into my career then, I started to take it more serious and I've hired coaches. I've taken courses. I've done a lot of consulting to learn the trade, learn the skill mm -hmm. of social media marketing. And you know, it's been over 600 days of posting and engaging and building these one-on-one -on -one relationships like me and you have now built and, and have a relationship just over and over day by day, week by week. And it, it just compounds just like it does with yeah. I, I just love your mindset as well. You seem like someone to me who really values hard work over a short-term fix. And how did you kind of get that mindset? Because it is so impressive. And you're someone who I really look up to in that way is, oh, I can keep going. I appreciate that, first of all. And like, that's very kind of you to say. But where my hard work stems from is a very funny story. Oh, and I want to hear it, this. It goes, it goes back to my childhood. So... 
Growing up, I was like a little bit of a chubbier kid. Like I was that kid that just was baby fat type of deal, right? And I played football as as a kid, like nine, ten, eleven years old. I started playing well, started playing football when I was ten years old. And some leagues will have a weight limit because、mm-hmm. they don't want younger kids to get hurt because football is obviously a contact sport and it, it's a safety thing. So. I wanted to play when I was ten. I was twenty pounds over the weight limit, though. So my dad basically said to me, as a ten-year-old kid, he's like, "Look, if you want to play, we got to diet, we got to run, we got to train, we got to start working out." So I'm ten years old, and like I'm going on this straight-up fitness regimen. Like, I remember my dad taking me on runs, and he would have me wearing two hoodies, two pairs of sweatpants, like long-sleeve shirts, and it was like June. Wow. And and he was doing it with me though. So like quick side lesson in the、mm-hmm. story is just leadership. Like my dad just ingrained that in me of like ask people to do things that you will do as well. Don't just ask them to do things that you wouldn't wouldn't do. So that was where my work ethic stemmed. And throughout my whole junior football and, and as a kid playing football, I never missed a weight limit. And that was it's like a funny. Quick aside of of sports growing up, but that is where I learned like, oh, if I work hard, I can see the rewards of something I do today, months in the future or years in the future, and I've taken those principles into everything I did later into high school athletics, into college athletics, and now into my career, and it all stems back to being a chubby little ten year old. <laughs> I love that. Have you? Do you ever listen to the Diary of a CEO podcast? Yeah, yeah, I've listened to many of his episodes. Did you listen to the most recent one with entrepreneurship? I, I have not. I have well, not. I can't remember exactly who was on it, but he was talking about how all the best entrepreneurs, right? When you ask them questions, you want to hear the start of the story back in childhood. And hearing your story start back in childhood, I was like, "Yep, makes sense. Checks out."、Yeah. With what you're doing right now, can you describe to me what exactly a certified financial planner actually does? So what's unique about my career as a financial planner, the term is very broad. So if you go and talk to ten financial planners, they might run their ten businesses differently, flat out. But what I can tell you, and maybe an example might help illustrate this, if you go talk to ten social media marketing agencies, they probably run their businesses differently, right?、Mm-hmm. So so similar. But what we essentially do, and We primarily, and I say we because I have three partners. We're a team. We、okay. primarily work with people in the tech industry or software as a service, more specifically, if, if you're familiar with that industry. And it's everyone from founders and CEOs to executives down to high-performing salespeople. That's that's the primary clients that we're working with. But essentially, what we do is this: everybody has a current reality. This is what life is today. This is what I'm living. This is where my money is. This is my personal life, professional life. This is current reality. Everyone has a desired reality.、Mm-hmm. Now, so, some people haven't gone to the extent of like, this is what I want. This is my vision. This is really where I want to be and who I want to be with and how I want to do it. Everyone hasn't defined that, but everyone has that when they think about like, what do I want life to look like? Whether it's five years, ten years, twenty years in the future. What、well, what our team does, we bridge the gap between those, and money is just the tool to do that. So I, I always tell everyone, and, and you've probably seen this in some of the things I post. Like, I strongly believe about finance that it's not about how do I save everything. It's how do I save enough, and I、right. use air quotes very specifically there because if we can define desired reality in the future. Then from there we can reverse engineer what enough is, which is what my team is hired for for to do,、mm. and then we craft a plan today of the actions that we need to take to get from current reality to desired reality later. And along the way, we're working with our clients ongoing for accountability, adjustments, making decisions on the fly as things come up in their life, stuff like that. That's so interesting. So, do you find like a lot of people come in initially where they don't have enough to find, so they're over chasing money? I would tell you most people haven't thought about 
what they want life to look like in the future. Really? Because they're so, not that they haven't thought about it, but they don't have a specific vision. Like it's usually very vague. And we have to ask a lot of questions and really dig and work on that because they're so bogged down in, hey, I'm a, I'm a successful high performer working in my day to day, trying to get from point A to point B as the day goes on and I'm meeting to meeting and call to call. And now I have my kids games and me and my wife are just trying to get one date night in a month. And we're going through all these things. And all of a sudden we have this birthday party for the kids friend and life is just crazy. Mm -hmm. And now you're trying to get to your money on the back end. And you're just so caught up in the day to day that you never take time to step away from it, strategize everything and work towards what you want to get to so people are just stuck in that they that they don't even look forward because they're like i just need to get through today i just got to get through the day today so it's a common challenge that we see and it's something that we often take i don't want to say a lot of time but we take a lot of we we take a lot of intention to define that with the people that we work with because all of the financial recommendations we're going to give them they should be dictated by that. It shouldn't be, hey, Laura, put your money here because this is good. It should Mm -hmm. be, Laura, put your money here because this will do this for you and get you to what that vision is and here's how. I love that. And yeah, I think that just speaks to your philosophy as well. I, I sense that you're the type of person where you would never want a client to do something that was kind of against their wishes. And the other thing that I want to say as well, when you have all these people come in with all these fears, etc., what do you think their actual reason is for avoiding those sort of things is? And what are the reasons that they give you? It's a really good question. And we deal with this a lot. There, mm-hmm. there, are, there are some very smart people that hire us, mm-hmm. but they hire us because they need to be held accountable and they need someone to just be that force in their life of like, no, dude, you need to do this, for example. Now, now back to the, to the main point of the question on fears. I think a lot of people don't define that future out of fear because the, as, I, as I just talked about in that quick aside of like, the day to day is so busy and there's so many challenges and everyone's just trying to get to the next day and make sure that things are okay. Bills are paid. Money is away where it needs to be that they don't think about the future. But, but the problem that that creates for people is that they might be making small, mm. hurt, small, hurtful decisions today that are compounding in the opposite direction. So I'll give you an example. Did you ever hear of how like uh, uh, an air an airplane, a commercial airplane pilot, if he changes course by one degree, he mm-hmm. ends up in a totally different city, right? Well, our financial habits, it's the same exact thing. So someone that they might have a thousand dollars in credit card debt and a thousand dollars, I mean, to really anybody is like, hey, it's a thousand bucks. Like I can, I can pay that off, you know, one month of work, like sort of save my money. Regardless of how you make it, even if you, even if you're close to minimum wage, that's a doable task to pay that off over time if you need to. But if your lifestyle doesn't change because there's not enough pain there, and now a thousand is two thousand, and then three, and then it's six, and then it's twelve, and then you wake up one day and it's seventy thousand, mm. then then you're just like, how did I get in this scenario? Or on the contrary, maybe someone is putting off retirement savings because, hey, I don't wanna invest money. I don't wanna put money away to buy real estate or whatever, because I'm gonna have more time to do this in the future. Then the future comes and things are more expensive. Uh, You have kids now, you're married, there's more expenses. All of these things compound that you wake up 20 years later and you're so far behind. So many people let the fear of not getting where they want to be just take over taking action at all and it's it's sort of contradictory because you don't think about it because it could be a big task to get to where you want to be because you're ambitious but by not thinking about it and not taking action and having a a specific plan to it you're only making a wider gap between where you want to be 
So I think that Mm -hmm. from the fear component, I think that's why most people ignore these things, especially early in their career. Yeah, for sure. And I think, especially when we're younger, it's just, I mean, spending money is so ingrained in our society. So it's almost like spending addictions are kind of normalized, like someone having a spending problem, like going out all the time, all that kind of stuff. How do you get people to break those patterns of behavior? And what would you recommend someone listening do if they think that they might have a spending problem? It's very hard, but where I would start is defining that desired reality. Like really sit down, get a legal pad. Like I have legal pads, so I have two of them right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm living on legal pads, but I'll, I, I think it's important to sit down, blank sheet of paper, grab a pen, write out what you want your life to look like in, in a year. Start with that because if you look out 10 years, it becomes very difficult, but do a year. Maybe you could do three years. And the further you could go out, the more powerful it will be. But that needs to be the first step because when you go to change your habits, things are gonna be difficult. So when things get difficult, if you don't have any bigger purpose that you're linking the sacrifices you're making in the present to, you're going to quit when times are hard. And that's mm-hmm. not just anybody that's in that situation. That's me, that's you, Laura, that, that's anybody. Anybody we know, that's, that's going to be what happens. The next step I would take is identifying what am I actually spending today? So do a budget, but Mm -hmm. like not just a like, okay, here's a budget. Look back at what you've been spending. And if you have no idea how to do that or that's too painful for you, this is what I typically recommend to clients to consider doing. Take one credit card or one debit card and for a full month, only put your expenses on that card. Be conscious as you spend throughout the month. And if you're about to buy something where you're sort of second guessing yourself, you probably shouldn't buy it. I'm not the guy that's going to be about restriction with finance. Like I'm never Mm going to say, Hey, don't buy something. Don't do something because you got to enjoy life today. Like we we don't Mm -hmm. know how long we're going to be here. We don't know what the future holds. We need to balance enjoying life today with securing tomorrow, but be conscious for a month of your spending at the end of that month, grab the statement look back at the month and do a budget and say like, okay, I spent this much on gas. I spent this much on groceries. This is what I spent at Starbucks. This Mm -hmm. is what I spent on entertainment. Like do all of these things and you'll have a picture. Then you can look at your net income. So whatever your income from your check is after taxes, you'll see like, am I spending more than I'm making? Is there money that should be left over every month? Oftentimes what happens and and it's eye-opening for clients there's usually a lot more money left over than they realize when they start being conscious about spending. Mm -hmm. So then that's good and bad for a couple of reasons. It's bad because we've been wasting a lot of money. It's good because there's a lot of opportunity that if you can maintain this budget, we can now take that pay off credit card debt if you have it, or if you don't have credit card debt and you just want to start saving because you never have, we can start putting that places for you to save. So those are two or three steps that I think really anybody can go ahead and implement in their own lives right now. That's so interesting because to me, it feels like almost a diet, if that makes sense, like a financial diet. So obviously if someone tells you to be super strict with all of your spending and it's like zero to 100, you're not gonna stick with it. Like the same way that people go keto or whatever. Like, I, I, it just sounds like you have a really balanced and sustainable approach. Yeah, it has to be. and. One of the things, like I'm I'm a younger guy in an old man's game, right? Like average age of a financial advisor is like in their fifties or even sixties. I don't even know, but I'm, I'm 25. Right. And Mm -hmm. with what I do, I'm, I'm someone that I'm not going to like save every dollar I get. Like, I don't care. I'm going to save enough. I'm going to save the money I need to, to hit my goals. And a big objection I was seeing early in my career for people to come work with me was I don't want to save everything. I don't want to be told to stop spending. It's not about that. I I have a client and they're well off, but they're like, Hey dude, we spend 20,000 a year on travel. We spend this on uh, going out to eat. I'm like, look, I'm not going to tell you to stop spending money on that. That's not what I'm here to do. But if we're putting money away for your goals and they're taken care of, and we know based on your projections and what we're planning that you're going to be good. I don't care if you spend $40,000 as long as your plan permits it. 
that's right. that's the piece that people miss is as long as your plan permits it i love that because it really just allows for that flexibility to actually bring life in i'm i'm noticing as well i can see on your bookshelf you've got some books i have a feeling yeah. there's some of my favorite books as well can you tell us a little bit about what you've got behind you yeah so these two right here i'm like backwards pointing these <laughs> those are alex hormozzi's books so 100 million dollar offers and 100 million dollar leads they were great books 100 million dollar offers helped structure my entire business quite frankly and then leads is just a, a great book on marketing and, and how to market your business how to grow your business that one is think and grow rich um I love that book as well my first, I'll tell you a quick story about that book and, and why I like it so much. My first year in business, I was in my first three months and I had made like $300 in three months. And like, this is full time for me. Like that is my only income. So do the math. I was making like 30 cents a day. Obviously you can't live on that. I'm very fortunate that I was living with my parents still when I started. So I, I had that buffer, but even at that pace, I'd be leaving this industry going into something else if I kept on that. And, and I sucked. Like I, I was, I was failing in meetings. I wasn't getting clients. They just weren't converting to work with me. I picked that book up. Like I, I had it for years and I finally picked it up and was like, I'm going to read this and I'm just going to implement it and do whatever it says. So there's, in that book, I, I think I think I know the actual page. I think it's page 42, if I remember correctly. But he talks about his six steps to riches. And this is about money, but it's not about money. He says, like, all the steps you go through that you need to visualize something, think about it, how to carry out the actions for it. And anything that you think about in your mind, you can then materialize in your life through taking these steps. And if you think about it, it's it really is a profound thing because what is, what has been created in this entire world that didn't begin as an idea. Right. So when, so when you boil everything back to that, it's like, well, you sort of got a point there because let's just use the example of someone amassing a net worth of $10 million, like just as right. an example, if I don't think in my mind ever once in my life that I'm someone who can amass $10 million. What are the chances that I'm ever going to do that? Right. Just in general, like zero, it's zero. It, it literally is zero because if you don't think you could, you won't flat out. Right. So just thinking it isn't going to get you there, but it's going to put you in the arena of possibilities. So anyways, besides the point, I'd made $300 to that point in my career. I read that book. I follow this process. I follow other things in the book. I'm writing things out, doing the systems and process that he talks about. And I went on to have an amazing first year in business and set records in my company revenue wise that no one's ever done. And like, Laura, I sucked. Like I was awful. I was like, I don't even know what to call me. So <laughs> if I can, if I can turn things around, anybody could. And yeah, it started with the mindset. And it's funny how, when you focus on what you want in life, things just start to open up for you in terms of opportunity. So who are the people in your life who gave you kind of a big break? So the first thing I would say is probably my dad. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be a doctor my whole life. My dad's a family doctor. Yeah. He has a very successful practice. So the original plan, like day one plan was go to school, go to medical school, take over his practice that he's built up for 30 years and I pretty much had the red carpet laid out in front of me. It was like, all right, Mondo, go to school and take over dad's practice. And you're going to make the money that he made as a 30 right. year veteran in your first year as a doctor. Like, like I had it made. All I had to do was pass school. It's that simple. And I had an immediate, like amazing mentor to learn from in the field. Like it was perfect. So naturally I, did, I decided not to do that after I was in school for a year. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but the reason was like my whole life, I wanted to be like him because I saw the way people treated him. I saw the respect he got. We grew up well. There was presents mm -hmm. under the under the tree on, on Christmas, and I never really went without. It's not like we were filthy rich, but I had a good childhood. So I'm like, all right, mm -hmm. I would I would like to live a life like that. And I get to school. Not for, it's not for me. Start talking to my dad, 
And he's totally receptive. He's like, dude, that's fine. You don't need to be a doctor. You don't need to be me, but I'm paying for your school and I'm the luckiest kid in the world. My dad paid for my school, but he's like, I'm paying for school. You are going to find what you're doing because you're not just going to go to school undecided and, and waste your time. So I, I start talking to people in his network. The mm -hmm. second, the second call I made was to his financial advisor who really is what got me interested in this career. And I would say he's probably the second person that quote unquote gave me a break mm -hmm. and he met, he mentored me through college. So that was in 2017 when I first talked to him, mentored me through college. I interned with him throughout college. And then in 2020, I started this career under his guidance and he was a very big reason for what I did in my first year of business and even moving on forward. Like I, I can't give him enough credit and awesome. he's one, and he's one of my partners now. So I have three partners in business and, and wow. he's one of them. That's so cool. So looking forward, who, who would be someone that you would love to talk to? If I could have a conversation with anybody, like there's that, that question, would you take $500,000 or have dinner with Jay-Z? Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> who's my, who's my dinner with Jay-Z? It's, it's Hormozy. Like his two books yeah. have been crazy. If I could just have one hour and, and pick anybody's brain, he would totally be the guy. I'm pretty sure in Las Vegas, actually, they have, if you make yeah. 250K a year or more, it's like 5K that you can go meet them. Really? Yeah. That's very interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, just something to keep in mind for sure. Have you ever thought yeah. about starting your own podcast or anything like that? Because I find you so interesting. I feel like that would be a really cool thing for you to do. Thank you. And yes, I have. So this year, it, it may be this year, late, later in the mm -hmm. year. It, if not, it, it will absolutely be 2025. But I'm hoping sometime in the summer, I can get things in motion and maybe launch for fall. It's on the back burner right now, just because what I do for LinkedIn alone is mm -hmm. a lot. And, and that's growing my business like crazy. I mean, I get 12 inquiries a month on average from LinkedIn and wow. we're growing, we're growing like, like crazy right now. We've brought on 10 clients this year, which we're pretty much hitting our targets of where we want to be. We want to bring on five every month. So we've brought on 10 this year so far. We're looking like we're going to bring on five more in March and, and continue on that pace. And not that we can't handle the capacity, but we're just really in, in growth mode right now. And typically what happens in my industry is like they call them the J months, June and July are typically very slow. And mm -hmm. why are they slow? Everyone goes on vacation. Everyone has their barbecues. Oh, a little thumb popped up next to me, I guess. <laughs> everyone, everyone goes on vacation. They have their barbecues. And people don't want to talk about money when it's summer. Like they don't want to come sit in an office or, or really get on a Zoom meeting and talk about their retirement accounts or investing in real estate or investing in stocks. It's just not the time of year. So I'm thinking if it slows down, which I'm not going to manifest that it slows down because maybe it doesn't and things are great. But if it slows down in June or July, I think that could be a time that I look at starting one for myself. That would be so cool. Cause yeah, I could literally listen to you talk all day. Really interesting guy. And you always have so many wise things to say, but we are almost out of time. So the last question is for everyone listening, what is one thing that you want them to go home and think about tonight? What is one question that you would have for them? That first year in business that I was talking about where I set these revenue numbers and did these things and won these awards, it was the best and worst thing that happened to me. Mm -hmm. And the lesson that I'm going to talk about from this is what I really want everyone who hears this to, to take with them if they take nothing from what I've blabbed on about until this point. So I, I was chasing these numbers because they were known numbers that if I can produce this much revenue, I would hit these these benchmarks and break these records and do these things. And I remember I hit them. I went on a trip to Italy with my fiance and, and it was my then girlfriend. We actually got engaged in Italy. We went on this trip yeah. and, and we were celebrating the year. And then we got to celebrate the engagement while we were there because we got engaged while we were there. And, and it was just awesome. And I just remember looking back to the year past 
And I'm like, I love where I'm at. I love what I do. I love who I work with, but did I just climb a mountain that I never wanted to climb anyways, like flat mm -hmm. out. And I, re I remember sitting in Italy at a dinner and vividly thinking this, like, I just went after a goal that was given to me by other people, not a goal that I really wanted for myself. So the lesson here is, is define your goals for you. Your goals are not their goals, quote unquote. Define what you want. Define what success looks like for you. Control the actions that you could control, which I consider excellence is like, we control what actions we take today, what level those are to, the type of person that we are, the way we treat people, control all of those things. Success, which is just arbitrary bank benchmarks, like how much money you make or how much revenue you produce or how fast your business grows or the followers you have or whatever. Those things take care of themselves. Like they just will. Focus on this stuff, focus on excellence, focus on what you could control and you'll be much happier that way. I love that. Yeah. I mean, thank you so much for coming on today. I think that's a good one to end on. I mean, yeah, you're just a really wise guy. I hope you I hope you do start some sort of podcast. Yeah, I'm going to put your information in the description for anyone who wants to follow you because you are so awesome and you're such a genuine guy as well. So thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Again, I, I appreciate you having me and, and appreciate all your kindness. We both know what we want. Let's just keep it simple.